Hello. Today we're going to talk about extinction again. And in particular, I want to talk about not the decline in behavior that occurs when you conduct an extinction procedure, but uh, the kind of recovery that you often see uh, after you've done extinction. And a lot of people, particularly in contemporary research, are hugely in interested in these recovery effects because they have uh, profound implications for uh, the clinical application of um, behavioral principles. Uh, and they also have a pretty important theoretical implication. That is, if you um, conduct extinction and the behavior goes away, but then poof, it, it pops back up. It tells you that extinction doesn't result in the unlearning of a conditioned response. Rather, extinction involves uh, the inhibition or suppression of behavior. And unfortunately, the suppression is often not permanent. It's kind of temporary. And now, and this was evident uh, to Pavlov in early on. <laughs> Pavlov studied extinction, and on the first slide shows you uh, one of the effects, uh, these recovery effects that he identified. Now, uh, the graph starts out with uh, the extinction of the conditioned salivary response uh, to a uh, tone, let's say, and then you present a novel stimulus, a visual cue of some sort, and then you reintroduce the tone and what you find is that the salivation to the tone after this novel stimulus is higher than it was at the end of the preceding extinction series. So this is called the disinhibition effect. And it's this phenomenon that uh, uh, encouraged Pavlov to interpret extinction as a form of inhibition. Uh, the next slide illustrates another phenomenon Pavlov identified, which is spontaneous recovery. Here we do acquisition, uh, conditioned salivation, or conditioned fear, conditioned sign tracking, whatever you like, increases, goes to an asymptote. Then you do extinction, keep doing extinction trials, behavior goes down. Uh, and then you think you're finished, you you're celebrate your success. I imagine if you're doing uh, therapy for uh, stage fright, for example, and uh, stage fright, uh, fear of uh, public speaking goes down, and you think uh, uh, the, the therapy was successful, the therapist collect, collects their fee, and uh, the client uh, goes to perform a couple of weeks later, <laughs> and they're their stage fright has returned. That is a period of rest uh, results in the recovery of the extinguished response. This recovery occurs without doing anything special, hence Pavlov called this spontaneous recovery. And it's a common phenomenon and you see it over and over again. Uh, it uh, typically requires uh, a week or more to observe spontaneous recovery. So it's not like uh, you're gonna see this uh, within a few minutes, uh, but it does happen and it creates a problem for uh, uh, clinical applications of uh, uh, extinction type procedures. Uh, so these are old, old recovery phenomena and we've known for close to hundred years. The next one, <laughs> is the renewal effect. And we owe the renewal effect to somebody who is getting older, kind of like me. <laughs> but uh, he's not as old as Pavlov and he won't be for a long time. <laughs> this is Mark Bouton, who's one of the, uh, he's a real sweetheart, wonderful guy. Uh, and uh, an absolutely fabulous uh, scientist who is interested in the role of context in activating memories of, and, uh, and there are all kinds of complications about that. Uh, but he discovered this effect, which has come to be known as the renewal effect, which has uh, taken uh, the field uh, by storm. Uh, everybody 
has done a renewal experiment, including me. And though I must say I didn't get, manage to get mine published. <laughs> uh, anyway, th this phenomenon has uh, attracted a tremendous amount of interest and continues to attract a tremendous amount of interest. So how does this one go? This was a little more complicated. As I uh, mentioned, um, Mark uh, uh, Bouton was interested in the uh, how context uh, operates to activate memories. So in this experiment, you do acquisition in one place, in a particular context, call it context A. This may be a, a, a chamber that's fairly bright and illumination as a particular olfactory uh, 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 cues, uh, maybe the odor of cinnamon, uh, it's got uh, shavings on the floor and so on. And you do acquisition and everything works as you would expect, nothing unusual there. And then you start doing extinction. But you start doing extinction in a different place. So now the subject is moved to a different environment. It may not be, it may be darker, it may be a little bit noisy, it may have a, a, a solid floor instead of wood shavings on the floor and so on, maybe a different smell. So you do extinction somewhere else. And after that, you look to see whether this extinction training can be, uh, uh, has eliminated the behavior or uh, if the extinction training uh, recovers and you do the test for recovery by moving the subject back into context A. And what you find is that the behavior is renewed in context A, hence the, term, the phrase, the renewal effect. Now, there are a couple of uh, interesting things about this. Uh, first, uh, take note of the fact um, that uh, acquisition performance, we train up the subject in context A, then we shift him to context B, and there's no drop off in performance with that context change. So acquisition performance generalizes from context A to context B. But when we do extinction in context B and then bring the subject back to context A, we don't see that generalization. The generalization of extinction is uh, not as uh, great across contexts. So extinction tends to, one of the lessons here is that extinction tends to be context specific, whereas acquisition, not so much. All right, so why is this of interest? Well, it's of interest for the same reason that this uh, habitual, uh, disinhibition and uh, spontaneous recovery are of interest. They tell you that extinction is not the unlearning of a conditioned response. But it's also of interest because uh, this paradigm of context A, context B, and then test in context A, that's a, that's a sequence that's frequently experienced in the course of clinical treatment. So uh, this uh, the most uh, common application of, of a situation where you see this is in uh, in uh, on the treatment of maladaptive fears. Now, uh, somebody comes in, we talked about stage fright, fear of public speaking, or social anxiety, fear of being with other, other people, uh, fear of being intimate with other people. We usually don't know where or how this fear was originally acquired. So we don't know what context A was. We measure the fear once the client comes in for treatment. And then what is the treatment? Well, the treatment is to expose the client to the cues that he, uh, uh, elicit the fear so as to extinguish those cues. And that treatment is typically conducted in a therapist's office. What's so what, what's the complication there? Well, the complication is that you want the fear to be uh, suppressed, in, not just in the therapist's office, but in other places 
where the client may subsequently uh, uh, encounter this fearful situation. And so you want the extinction experience to generalize to other contexts. And if you move out of the therapist's office, usually you see a renewal effect. You see some renewal of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the fear. And uh, this uh, seriously limits the efficacy of uh, cognitive behavior therapies for anxiety disorders, anxiety disorders. Uh, and it, the problem is even deeper than that. Because if someone, a client presents to a, a therapist that um, they're uh, extremely anxious, there's very high level, there are levels of fear that are so high that it requires therapeutic intervention. Often the client may be so distracted by their level of fear that the therapist says, says hey, we don't have time to do 10 sessions of extinction. I've got to get this person calmed down sooner than that. And so the therapist is going to recommend uh, an anxiolytic, a, a, a drug that will reduce fear. There are very highly effective drugs now available, developed through animal research on fear conditioning, in, incidentally, usually using the um, Pavlovian instrumental transfer design. Anyway, <clears throat> there are lots of really good uh, drugs available that reduce the fear that uh, people with high anxiety experience. So <clears throat> the therapy that uh, is conducted to help them overcome this fear is often conducted in combination with a uh, prescription of a drug. It turns out that if you do extinction in the presence of a drug state, the extinction <clears throat> uh, effectiveness gets limited to that drug state. A drug state acts in the same fashion as a change in the external context uh, so that uh, uh, any therapeutic benefits that are uh, learned and acquired in a drug state may not generalize when you're tested out of that drug state. So the renewal effect is a, is a huge problem. And uh, what uh, controls uh, renewal effects and circumstances under which it occurs and so on is, is a matter of a tremendous amount of work uh, and it, a lot of contemporary research, both in behavioral mechanisms and the neuroscience of extinction is focused on these sorts of phenomena. Now, there are a number of other renewal of, uh, recovery effects that I don't have time to talk about, but I do want to talk about uh, what do you do to overcome these, these uh, recovery effects? What do you do uh, to make sure that extinction uh, is more enduring and permanent? And the last slide that I want to show you lists a number of uh, procedures that are recommended and uh, people are working on uh, on solving this problem as we speak there are a lot lots of research on how to enhance extinction effects and some of the ways of uh, that you want to uh, you can accomplish this is a pretty straightforward increase the number of extinction trials <laughs> you know if you get recovered do some more extinction uh spacing extinction trials generally effective one of the things that uh, people don't uh, do often enough is to repeat extinction and test uh, slash test cycles. That is, if you see recovery, well, do some more extinction and then test for it again. And if you see recovery, do some more extinction. You know, uh, we tend to think about psychotherapy as sort of solving your problem. Uh, well, uh, psychotherapy is often analogous to uh, the management of a chronic disease, you know, diabetes. You don't solve someone's diabetes. If somebody has type 1 diabetes, often with type 2 as well, it becomes a chronic issue. And so you need to uh, program interventions to, to manage the disease. 
that's true for psychological problems too. You need to uh, program interventions to manage uh, uh, the disorder and the interventions that you want to manage is to keep reintroducing extinction. And uh, the last point here is you want to do that extinction in lots of different places. The more places you do extinction and the more extinction you do in more places, the less likely you are going to get uh, recovery effects like the renewal effect. So <laughs> extinction, pretty straightforward. Analysis of extinction, not so straightforward. Uh, extinction really is a fundamental concept um, in the treatment of fears and phobias. And so all of these complications that have been discovered in the course of uh, animal research dealing with uh, circumstances of extinction uh, become highly relevant uh, to cognitive behavior therapy. So if you have a problem, <laughs> you undergo extinction. I hope it's successful, but if you fall off the wagon, don't get discouraged. Just go back for a refresher and you may have to do a refresher over and over again and uh, you'll manage uh, your, uh, your fear and anxiety. So best of luck and I hope the rest of your life will be totally free of any fear and any anxiety. Well, that's kind of silly. I mean, there's some fears are sensible. <laughs> anyway, see you next time. Thanks a lot, folks.